Good to have you here. Uh, we're gonna. Why don't we stand? Come on in if you're out in the foyer. We'll get started. Anybody streaming? Good to have you with us. No donuts this week, but that's okay. Hey, we open our services with a particular tradition. That's praying for other communities of faith here in the great state of Maine. Uh, today, a church kind of near and dear to our heart, the Mechanic Falls Vineyard. Actually, uh, a church that was planted or started from a group of people out of this church in 1997. They've now faithfully. I uh, just serve the communities out there on Mechanic Falls. So let's cheer and pray for them this morning. Lord, thank you for Mechanic Falls Vineyard as they have service this morning. We pray your blessing upon them, Lord. We thank you for Mike, his leadership team, and all those that are uh, just being kind to their community in the name of Christ. Lord, for them, as for all of us that name the name Jesus, our heart's desire is that our inspiration would always arise from the Spirit of God that lives within us, and the truth of your word. May that be true of them. May that be true of us. And for us here today, Lord, we come before you and we say, Lord, we know you're here. May we now experience you as we offer you this uh, time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, say hi to the people beside you. Let's worship. of every 
every song could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We'll live for you, oh Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We'll live for you. Oh, we'll live for you.
Stay. 
As we get ready to take communion, I want to alert you that the baskets are behind you in the rear of the church, the rear of the building. So we just came out of Easter. In the name, the 
name that resurrected. We saw his power in his resurrection. We saw his healing. We saw him bring life. And so as we move into the week after Easter, that resurrection is fresh. So as we prepare this communion, we peel back the first layer for his, for his body, the bread, the bone, and as we take it, we take this with freshness, with freshness of his body, with freshness of his bone. And so let us take this together. as we prepare the cup and we open it this song speak Jesus over our families I speak Jesus over our children I speak Jesus over our communities I speak Jesus over our buildings and it says speak Jesus in the streets but I have a hearing deficiency so it's always been Jesus and industries and so we go go with that too we speak Jesus over the industries that everyone is in and it's okay when you don't have the scripture don't have the literature just to speak his name for healing speak his name for power and life so let us consume his blood for those Heavenly Father we come to you today just thanking you for giving your body and giving your blood so that we can so that we can consume its nourishment for our spirit and so we speak your power, we speak your life, we speak your healing over everyone in this room today, over everyone's families, over everyone's careers, in Jesus name we pray, amen
Father, we do. We love your presence. We love that you're here with us right now and, and that sometimes you nudge us a little bit to act. And so this morning, as, a, as an act of obedience to what I feel like God's put on my heart today, um, I, I, I want to model what that looks like, to follow the nudges of God. And so this morning, first service, um, I just felt like we have to pray for Vanessa. And I didn't know Vanessa, um, but we did. We prayed for her first service. And I think this service, I want us to pray for them together because oh I'm putting you right on the spot this morning when we were when we prayed for you it was about like well what would you speak Jesus over yourself right now and you said that you were so thankful that God had saved your life and there was just such joy as we were singing and worshiping and she was crying and it was so emotional but now I know a little bit more of her story we talked between services and you've been through a lot of pain but God has brought you through it for a purpose and there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of people here right now. There's a lot of people here right now who are in pain. And so would you pray for them? Yes. <laughs> Praise God. Um, before I pray, I just want you to know that whatever happens, God is always on your side, however it looks. When we keep that in mind, it's you just know that the biggest guy is on your side. It's you know, whatever happens, it's gonna get better. And now let's close our eyes. I'm gonna pray. Thank you, God, for inviting us here. Thank you for allowing us to show up. God, I just pray that you may just clean our hearts first. I pray that this prayer may please you. I pray that you're proud of us, Father God. I pray that whoever you plan to answer, whether today or not today, Father God, I pray that you may just give us hope. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. With the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that the peace that has nothing to do with our circumstances, that's what I ask for everyone. I pray that you may put the sign of the blood of Jesus on everyone here in Jesus' name. I pray that we, be, we may be made new today in Jesus' name. I pray that we may reflect who you are. May the light of Jesus Christ shine through us, not for our glory, but for yours, Jesus Christ. I pray that you may protect our steps. I pray that you will be done in Jesus' name. I pray that you hold our hand, Father. I pray that you guide us and you remind us of who you are every day. I pray, Father God, that you may protect us from everything that's not supposed to see us or hear us. I pray that you may show yourself who you are in our lives. And I pray that your will be done, not ours or however it looks like, Father, but you will be done because I know you're on our side. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Ooh. That lady's a preacher. All right. Hey, good to see you all here this morning. My name is Seth. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, this morning, if you came and you have an offering or tithe that you want to give, please do that on your way out. Uh, there's boxes at all the doors. You can go online. You can give in, in many different ways. Uh, so let me pray a blessing over that. So Father, thank you again just for this day, for the hope that Vanessa talked about. Thank you that we have hope. And thank you that we can be here together. Just pray that you'd bless all that's given today in your name. Amen. Uh, real quick before the announcements, today is the, the beginning of the youth conference, right? Starts tonight. It's not too late. Get your teenagers signed up. Uh, it's going to be awesome starting tonight, and then they come back early tomorrow morning, and they spend the whole day here uh, learning about Jesus, growing in fellowship, doing, doing all that stuff. So, yes, please get them involved. And now, check out the announcements. Welcome to Pathway. We're glad you're here. My name's Malik. I'm on staff here at Pathway. And if you're new here, we would love to connect with you. 
If you are tech savvy, you can scan the QR code, use your smartphone, fill the connect card out right from your phone. If you prefer paper and pen, we have paper connect cards just for you. Regardless, however you wanna fill it out, we would love to connect with you at the info booth after service. Every newcomer gets a gift just to say thank you for checking us out today. Memberships, are you thinking, I wanna become a member at Pathway? Maybe you have questions and you're not sure where, when, or how to ask. You're invited to join us April 20th at 6 p.m. for memberships. Child care is provided. Please sign up using the Church Center app. Weekend with Costa Mitchell. Okay, this guy's traveling all the way from South Africa. He's the National Director of the Vineyard in South Africa, and he's going to be in Maine April 28th and 29th, Friday night, 7 p.m., We'll have a night of worship teaching as we welcome the Holy Spirit. April 29th, Saturday morning, 8.30 a.m., breakfast with Mr. Mitchell and the man, where we'll have manly conversations with man of today. See you there. Newcomers, anyone, anywhere, any takers? Okay, and if you are new, I see you back there, and you have not attended a newcomers event, this event is for you. Newcomers gives you a chance and us to break bread, get to know one another, and all you have to bring is your appetite, smile, and questions. But you must sign up on the Church Center app. See you Sunday, April 16th, after service, 12 p.m. Life groups. Life groups are starting back up. I love life groups, and I love an expo, and we have a life group expo. Life groups helps us live in fellowship every season. That's an acronym. We encourage you to do life this season in a live group. April 23rd is the Life Group Expo. Who doesn't like an expo? See you there. And for our final segment, did you know, tulips are worth their weight in gold. Tulips are once more valuable than gold. And because they're the earliest flower to bloom, it came with a lot of value. So if you would please stand Please turn to the person next to you and ask them what's their favorite tool. And as always, we hope you feel love and welcome here at Pathway. Good. Let's settle in. Good to be with you today. My name is Alan. Any of you that are new to Pathway, thrilled that you're here. And actually, you might have noticed April 16th is today. So if you'd like to join us for newcomers, uh, we'll actually let you get over there without even signing up on the Church Center app this morning. You can just come crash it at 12. We'd love to be right across the street. We'd love to just have a, a, a simple connection with you. Well, we've been in a series uh, we love to do uh, every year. We take time to uh, make sure some of our uh, preaching series are specifically going through uh, the different books of the Bible. Last year we did an uh, extended series through 1 Corinthians, a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a uh, city-state, uh, ancient, what's now an ancient city-state in an area of the world known as Corinth, and to a group of early believers, early church, Christian church, uh, called the Corinthian Church. And uh, this letter, 2 Corinthians, is a second letter that he wrote, just addressing various things within the context of Christian community. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians, he really had to go after a bit of division that arose up within the church and really help them get back on course in terms of being who it is that God had called them to be as the people of God. 2 Corinthians, he's again addressing uh, various things that are going on in the church. Some of it is celebratory. He's encouraging and celebrating, uh, giving high fives and attaboys uh, where things are going well. But as a leader of leaders and one who really had the heart of a pastor, really wanted the best for and from this community of faith, he's also really challenging them and is exhorting them. And anytime we find exhortation in the Bible, it's meant to do a couple of different things. It either affirms kind of decisions that we've made, encourages us, or it provokes us to maybe move towards something that God might be inviting us into. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we'll be in today is a bit of an exhortation. Last week we talked about how our yes to Jesus, when we say yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus, I want to receive that which he's offering me, when we say yes to that, it affords us the big exchange. We, we in a sense, take our old self, our old life, what is known as a, a sinful man and that's prone to every type of brokenness in, in, in creation, and we get to exchange that for a new forgiven life that then enters into a journey towards wholeness and healing. And we're made new through Christ's forgiveness and what we call the indwelling of his spirit. We believe when someone says yes to a relationship with God that his spirit actually comes and dwells within them. Paul said it this way as we were in chapter 5 last week. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you've started a relationship, you begin your journey with Jesus... The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. That's the good news. That's the great exchange. We're no longer defined by sin and the consequence of sin. In exchange, we're given a brand new life, an eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's the hope of the gospel. In chapter 6, Paul, speaking to the church, again, he's speaking to Christ followers here. He exhorts that they would allow this new life, this decision to follow Jesus, to really begin to shape who they are as now the people of God. That they would take this decision to follow Jesus with sincerity, that what they pledged to or gave themselves to or surrendered to, whatever language you want to use, that that decision would actually now begin to determine the way that they live, just as it should for us here in the 21st century, as the 21st century followers of Jesus, that, that decision to say yes to what Jesus, the life that Jesus offer, is offering us, actually determine the way we live. You think of it this way. Think of one who puts in the time and makes a decision to become a physician. They're given a uniform, right? They, doctors dress in a very specific way, particularly when they're performing their duties in the hospital. As they're becoming physicians, they take what is called the Hippocratic Oath. It's a fairly long statement, but in summary, the oath that the doctors take is to do no harm. That's their commitment. That comes with the uniform. That they would do no harm, that they would have the patient's well-being as their highest priority. Or think of a police officer. Police officers typically take a pledge. Protect and serve. It comes with the uniform. There's an expectation that what comes with the uniform would sincerely be living out. And when one puts on the uniform per se, but doesn't sincerely live according to their commitment, we all know that doesn't work out well. And it takes a toll. We, in a sense, when we said yes to Jesus, have put on a uniform. As Romans 13 says that we have clothed ourselves in Christ. We've put on this new life, this new way of living. Thus, when we say yes to Jesus, there's an expectation that we live authentically to the oath that we've made, to our profession of faith. Now keep in mind, and I will live and die on this good news, that the journey with Jesus is filled with grace. And we only come into relationship with God based on grace, the grace that he's lavished upon us. And he's very patient with us. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's a journey filled with grace, mercy, and the affection of a heavenly father. A father in the most perfect sense of what the word means. 
But the journey does involve movement towards something. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. 2 Corinthians 6, Paul opens by just speaking a little bit of the with sobriety of the choice that we make to follow Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6 1 says, As God's co workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. I mean, God's grace was costly, it cost him his life, it cost him his son's life. And so there is a bit of, of soberness to uh, exactly what it costs so that we could have freedom from our brokenness. He goes on to say, for he says, God says, in, in the time of my favor I heard you. In the day of, my, of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And so it's a big deal. You know, it, it's not, you know, just kind of fire insurance that we, well, I'll say a prayer, hopefully I make it on the other side. It's a big deal. And so with it really becomes now, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? And that's what Paul is, again, helping the church in Corinth really uh, come to grips with. What does it actually mean to call oneself Christian? What are we moving towards? If I was to paraphrase chapter 6, I would say about this portion of the letter, something like this. If somebody said, well, what's what's kind of the paraphrase of chapter 6? I would say, I think Paul's saying if Jesus is worth anything... He's worth everything. Let's go all in. If this journey with Jesus is worth anything, then put everything on the table. Go all in with Jesus. My big idea for today is this. It says, the journey with Jesus is lived in the process of transformation. Meaning, what we believe should affect the way we live. What we believe should affect the way we live. And part of the reasons Paul had to bring this exhortation to the church in Corinth is, again, there were some, some people that had infiltrated the church that had less than pure motives. They were knocking the people off kind of the pathway that God had laid before them. And Paul, in a sense, speaking towards them and, 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 and you know, inviting the church to kind of to deal with that situation. Uh, but he's also really, again, helping the church understand uh, that what we believe affects the way we live. If we've learned anything in the past couple of decades, particularly the couple of years most recently removed from us, it's clear that cultural Christianity is not transformative. Christianity by tradition is not transformative. But Christianity that captures the attention of the mind and the heart, it'll change a life. And many of you are living examples of that. You know that you are not the person you were before Jesus came to the rescue. See, as God sees it, when we say yes to Jesus, we enter a new world. Our citizenship no longer singularly lives in the, the present age that we see, but we receive full citizenship in the kingdom of God. And as we learn what it means to be citizen of God's kingdom, we adopt new ways of living in this present age that we live in. N.T. Wright says it this way, he's a contemporary theologian, speaking of the new life that's afforded us when we say yes to Jesus. He says, when a new world is born, a new way of living goes with it. This is true of so many stages of life. It's true when a couple have their first baby. A whole new chapter has opened in their lives, and nothing will be the same again. Amen? How many of you had no, that little kid came and nothing was the same again, right? It's better. Just keep telling yourself that. No, when, when, when change happens, when, parents, when people become parents, they have new responsibilities. Everywhere they go, they see things with new eyes. It is true when people who have lived in a small and maybe badly equipped house move into a large, well-appointed one. No more trips out back to get running water. No more piles of washing on the living room armchairs. And it is true when people move from one country to another. A new language needs to be learned. New laws apply. If you speak the old language and live by the old laws, you won't fit in. You won't know what's happening. And the same is true as Christians. When, When we say yes to Jesus, we enter this new life. 
It then comes with a new way of living. As Christians, our highest value becomes to live within the influence and the activity of the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we belong to. And although we're inhabitants of this present age, our citizenship now lay in the kingdom of heaven. And in that kingdom, there is a king. And he has laid out a perfect pathway before us that is meant to bring us life. Not just simply restrict us from maybe the life we want to have, but to bring us an authentic life that does just that. You know, as a pastor, one of my great privileges and just the sweetness that comes with this territory is to present opportunities for people to begin a journey with Jesus, just like we did last week. At Pathway wide at all of our campuses, over 70 people made some level of a public proclamation to follow Jesus, which is fantastic. And that's, that's an amazing privilege. And oh, I'd say now over 32 years of my time here in Pathway, it's not an exaggeration to say I've seen thousands of people raise their hand and say, I want to follow Jesus. That's sweet. But the, all those thousands of people are not here. For some, it was a fleeting moment. So probably what's sweeter than, than, than witnessing that moment, in which many of those, those moments are very real, what's even sweeter than that is to actually then begin to walk in relationship with people and actually see with my own eyes and witnessing the transforming power of God in their lives. Becoming disciples. Lifelong lovers and learners of Jesus. And, and that, that is a, a, a sweet, sweet part of this journey in leadership. When we get back to Paul. Paul had his own encounter with the risen, with, 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 with Jesus Christ. And I mean, it was dramatic. It mo- literally shook him to the core. If you've never read the account, I, I encourage you to read it. When he was previously named Saul, he had this amazing uh, awakening to Jesus Christ. And from that moment, his life began to be shaped by the decision that he made to say yes to Jesus. Paul now sees both mountaintop experiences as well as the valley of the shadow of death moments through the lens of his faith journey. And we get a glimpse into that into the next portion of writing here in verses 3 through, through 10. Although he is, in a sense, still speaking towards those that are being rabble-rousers within the community of faith uh, because they're questioning his authority, what he's also doing is really giving us a glimpse into the way that he views life. He says it this way, he says, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. He says, Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. In a sense, he's saying, if you, if you observe our life, as you observe my life, everything I do is committed to God. He describes it this way. He says, in great endurance, I'm commended to God. In troubles, I'm commended to God. In hardships and distresses, I'm commended to God. In beatings, imprisonments, and riots, and hard work, and sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, and the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report, good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. My life is not my own, he's saying. It's all for the glory of God. St. Ignatius would say it that, in this way, that we're to find God in all things. Paul says, that, 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 that's the testimony of my life. Jesus changed his life, as he has so many of ours. Again, part of the reason Paul points uh, to this way he's lived his life is a response to the criticism from those disruptors in the church. Uh, But beyond this, it serves as a window into understanding Paul's worldview. Saying, I live my life in such a way as to demonstrate how God is at the center of everything I've experienced. Every aspect of my life. And Paul doesn't do this as a way of trying to solicit praise. But rather as a testimony that his life, no matter the cost, 
is now being lived for the glory of God and to look out for the well-being of other people. Paul knows well the damage hypocritical living brings into a community of faith. So he, he has a plea to the church, and it is that like he, that they would live a life that is actually the product of what it is that they say they believe. And if there's anything the 21st century world needs, it's that the church of Jesus Christ would actually live a life that we say we believe. And that would usher light into a world that sometimes seems very dark and chaotic. In verse 11 and 13, it, it takes what it seems a little peculiar turn here that he addresses this specific situation, but I think it all ties in to his desire that the, the, the church really would allow what they believe to shape their behavior. And he points to a particular area that they can address uh, in, in verses 11 through 13. He says, we, speaking of him and, and those who are leading with him, he says, we have, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and we've opened our heart wide to you. He said, again, he's coming from a, a fatherly pastoral disposition here in his interaction with them. He says, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As fair exchange, I speak as to my children. He says, church, open wide your hearts. Like, if we're to respond to the greatest command, our community must be built on the foundation of love. Not divisiveness and division that has worked its way and infiltrated uh, the Corinthian church. He says, let the message you've embraced so inform and influence your behavior that we actually leave behind the infighting and the suspicion and become a community of faith that's known by our love, not by our division. The church of Jesus Christ does not serve the world well, nor themselves, when their focus is divisiveness over and above the love of Jesus Christ. What we believe should affect our behavior. This has been a theme of Paul throughout the letters to the church in Corinth that God has called his people to be marked by his qualities and his characteristics. And of course, we're empowered to do that through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. But we must, we must, we must be a people that actually live according to what we say we believe. And on that note, Paul finishes this portion uh, of thought with these very provocative words that have probably been a challenge to all of us that have been in the church of Jesus Christ for any period of time. But he does so, again, from a fatherly disposition. In the same way that in the best sense of the way, if you were parent of a child and you wanted the best for them and from them, you would, you would help them to learn to be attentive with who and what they associate themselves with. He says this. He says, church, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be tied together. Do not be hitched to unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can, uh, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, an ancient name for Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be your father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So we read that, and it probably, for all of us, it could be a bit provocative based upon relationships that we have, situations that we're in. But it's important that we know really the intent behind this. Uh, one theologian, Warren Worsby, says this about this passage. He says it's it is unfortunate that the important doctrine of separation has been misunderstood and abused in recent years, for it is an essential truth. Some sincerely zealous Christians have turned separation into isolation until their fellowship has become so narrow that they cannot even get along with themselves, right? Meaning that some, in some circles, Christians have so far removed themselves from society, they've kind of hunkered down and cloistered away, they really have no value to society and they become of little value to one another. 
That's not what this passage is saying is that we, that, we, that we so separate ourselves from those not walking with Jesus that we make it an us versus them reality. That's not what this passage is saying. In a sense, what this passage is saying, Christians, pay attention. Pay attention. Worsby goes on to say, in reaction to this extreme position of those zealous Christians, other believers have torn down all the walls and will fellowship with anybody regardless of what he believes or how he lives. While we applaud their desire to practice Christian love, we want to remind them that even Christian love must exercise discernment. And that's what's at the key here. So pay attention to what you submerge yourself in, what you surround yourself with, what you're allowing to become those primarily influencing factors in your life. Because what you behold, you become. And if you're a parent, you've said something like that to your kid. You hang around with them, you're going to start acting like them. Word of God says it this way. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Contemplate here, the way it's used, means to look thoughtfully for a long time. So in a sense, you could read it, we all who with unveiled faces thoughtfully look at God's glory for a long time. And as we do that, we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is in spirit. Word of God. We become what we behold. I'll give you my life as an example. Grew up in the church. Uh, Christian, sweet Christian heritage. Incredible experiences with God as a little boy. Uh, classically took my teen years and used them as an opportunity to rebel and had about a decade of just sowing a lot of pain into my life. Putting myself in situations and, infl and allowing influences to come into my life that were anything but godly. And in the process, not only caused myself harm and grief, but hurt others. But God is gracious, God is merciful, God is faithful to his promises. And in 1991, when I got sick and tired of being sick and tired of the way that I was living, and I brought myself back to a, a place that uh, I, I wanted to journey with Jesus, I stumbled into the Vineyard Church, and what accompanied that was decisions that I would have to make. What would I allow to be the influencing factors in my life? Who would I allow to be the influencers in my life? And some of that came with choices in which I had to, in some instances, actually step away from unhealthy places and unhealthy people. I couldn't be hitched to them. I couldn't be yoked to them. It was a destructive path. That's not to say that it wasn't hard, it wasn't painful, it wasn't confusing for some. I actually had some friends that uh, were confused by the choices that I began making when I returned to my walk with Jesus. And I only, all I could do in the most lovingly way, saying, I, I know you might not understand, but this is necessary for me to live. And pray that God would somehow give opportunity for me to now become the influencer in their life. But again, Paul's not saying this like, hey, here's the Christian rules. You know, clean yourself up, follow the rules. This is a loving father saying, here's the boundary markers. Play within them in this life. I don't want you to go outside the boundary markers. This is deadly. You know, if you've ever had little children around the house, my, my daughter's got about 17 baby gates up right now. Because not to restrict my grandson's, you know, freedom, but to offer a protective path for him to enjoy life. And that's what God's saying here. Pay attention to what you're allowing to influence you. And if necessary... And it may be necessary, there may be seasons that you have to step away from things that are destructive.
we're on this journey. And along that journey, it often means we do the necessary things to help us walk the path that we're intended to walk. When I signed up for the United States Army in 1983, I went down and did a swearing-in ceremony at a government building in Portland. In that August day in 1983, when I raised my hand and pledged to uh, be a, you know, a U.S. soldier, in that moment, technically, I was a soldier. But I then had to begin a journey of discovering what it meant to become a soldier. And so I had to begin to cooperate with you know, the path, or uh, actually I, I had to cooperate with now being a hostage to the United States government and go through basic training so that I could actually learn to become what it is that I profess to be. And that meant a change in environments. You know, that meant, uh, you know, uh, putting myself in new relationships with these wonderful, pleasant drill sergeants that could shape and mold me along the way. But it meant new influences and a, and a dedication to learning what it is that I signed up for. It's not the perfect example, but in a, in a way, when we say yes to Jesus, we are immediately made new. But life really then becomes about a journey of being made new. You say, how does it happen at the same time? I don't know. Ask God. It does. You're new, but you need to be made new. Which means we put ourselves sometimes in new environments. I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, you guys are at church today. But don't grow weary in that. This isn't a letter to brand new baby Christians. It's a letter to the church. Meaning that there's always danger of incrementally slipping away. You know, when people blow up their lives, like it doesn't go from, I speak the name of Jesus and we sing and we pray and then the next day our life blew up. It's incremental. It's a little compromise here. I know they don't feel the way I do, but they're really cute. Well, I have a business opportunity. I know the guy's not a Christian, but it's a really good business opportunity. I think I should get in, get in, in business with him. Then tax time comes around. And as a follower of Christ, you want to do things right. And your business partner, who doesn't give two thoughts to what Jesus thinks, has a loophole. Be careful who you hitch yourself to. That's what Paul's saying. Guys, pay attention. Because would it be that our lives would actually behold what it is that we say we believe? And that we become just these ambassadors of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. You know, our yes to Jesus should have implications that affect every relationship we engage with. And maybe God just needs to help you wrestle through that today. There is tension in this. You know, if you, if you are going to authentically follow Jesus, you are going to be the weird one in the room sometimes. Just embrace the awkward. Because you have something people need. But you will be. I mean, I've been in social situations, you know, just as, as a follower of Jesus. Because I haven't, sep I, I got friends that aren't walking with Jesus. I've got social circles I run in and family members and friends that they're not in the same place I am. And in those moments, I have to sometimes make decisions. So when something's being passed around and it comes my way and I realize, oh, I'm, I'm next in line. I have to make a decision on what I'll be hitched to. And at times I've got to be the awkward guy who goes, I don't do that, guys. You know I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, the Christian guy. That's okay. Because that same person, that same friend, that same family member that might mock you in one moment, when the gates of hell come crashing down on their life, you're going to be the first person that they call up and you're their priest. And that's a wonderful, wonderful place to be in when we can bring the good news, the saving news of Jesus Christ into someone else's life. Let's stand. Stand if you would. I, I got a prayer team that's going to come up right now. We uh, close all of our services here at Pathway by having people available to pray for you. 
Um, we'll pray for anything. If you have not started a journey with Jesus, you're like, I, 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 I want to do that. I, I want to begin a relationship with God. And these guys will start elevating off the floor if you come up and tell them that. And allow them to pray with you to start a journey with Jesus. We'd love to pray for that for you. Or maybe you've got something going on in life. We believe God hears our prayer. We believe God answers prayer. We're not always totally, totally sure on the way he answers prayer, but we believe he answers prayer. And we believe he gives us the freedom to pray for all things, physical healing, relational situations, financial situations, uh, uh, difficulties. Maybe, maybe this talk resonated with you and you thought, man, I, I need help. I need the courage to step away from some things, but I need God's help. One of my friends up here would just talk to God on your behalf. Sometimes God works in our lives through the prayers of other people. That's what builds community in our relationships. But we'll pray for anything that you've got going on. Let me close this up. Lord, we thank you for your word just as it, it challenged, encouraged, exhorted the uh, church in Corinth. Lord, would your word speak to us whatever it is that you would like it to say. And Lord, would we be the courageous people Lord whether you're calling us to step towards something or you're calling us to step away from something would you give us the courage to do so and the discernment Lord would we have wisdom in, in terms of what we surround ourselves in and what we allow to influence us so that so that our lives become a living testimony of the God we say we believe in I thank you for this group here today. I pray your blessing upon them. I thank you for what you're doing in the hearts of people here today. And Holy Spirit, we say more. Have your way with us. Open our eyes to see what you're doing this week, Lord. And give us the courage to step into it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like prayer for anything, come say hi to one of these guys. If you're going to the newcomer's reception, right across the street. God bless you. We'll see you on the journey. It's the way you love. You lay down your life. You Join a heaven's work and build your kingdom. Strengthen us with your courage. Filling our hearts with faith to join a heaven.